2017. Okay, uh, before start, a brief introduction about us. I'm Andrea Lievi, I'm a um, security, researcher, uh, and security research engineer of Microsoft now. I have uh, worked for three years for uh, the, Talos, uh, the Cisco Talos team, and I'm specialized in uh, Windows internal and uh, low-level uh, reverse engineering. I have previous work for PrevEx, WebRoot, and SaferBeds, uh, that are uh, uh, companies and uh, located even one is in Italy. I'm the original designer of the first UFI bootkit in the year 2012 and the first patch card 8.1 bypass presented in the year 2014. And I'm uh, the, um, one of the designers of the Windows uh, PT driver that we are going to present. And I'm Richard Johnson. I'm the research technical lead for Cisco Talos. Uh, we have a team that does vulnerability research and I help guide those efforts. Uh, you may see some of our vulnerabilities in the past year. Um, and we focus on technologies mostly for finding bugs. And uh, so this was, as he mentioned, uh, some of my talks the last couple of years at Recon have been in the focus of high performance applied to fuzzing and engineering technologies that give us uh, feedback driven fuzzing and um, componentizes the different parts of the process to try to make it as fast as possible. Um, I came across this new architectural feature in Intel CPUs called Intel Processor Trace uh, about two years ago, and um, basically it's a hardware-supported mechanism for doing code coverage, and uh, I made a prototype for this in 2015 that worked for Linux because there was experimental support um, via some open source drivers. And after evaluating it, I realized that this would be a great thing to bring to the Windows operating system, um, but the Intel support for it was not going to be suitable for what we were looking for. So um, last year at Recon, we had our very first version of the Windows driver working like an hour before we got on stage, and it was doing a raw decode. And so uh, we're going to talk about the last six months of developments, which have brought all kinds of support to the driver, and this picks up where the last one went off. So Andrea is going to give you the introduction of the technical details of the driver and the low-level implementation and some demos, and then we'll uh, address that as applied to fuzzing and finding bugs. Okay, speaking about processor trace. Uh, the processor trace is a, uh, is a new feature of the in latest Intel Skylake CPU. It's uh, very useful because it can trace whatever your CPU is going to execute, like uh, in hardware, and uh, it has some um, particular benefit, especially for, uh, code cover for dynamic code coverage. For example, if you would like to understand uh, what a particular piece of software would like to, uh, to do, for malware analysis or for whatever. I mean, the usage are, are um, various. For, um, I would like, uh, before, because we have uh, not a lot of time, I would like to be uh, uh, um, quite fast in, the, in describing the, how is, um, the Intel PT is, um, is executed in a, in a CPU. And I would like to concentrate on the new, fe on the new feature of, the, of our driver. Basically, um, being fast, the, um, to discover the Intel processor trace in a CPU, it's, uh, you can do even uh, in a user mode, only emitting two CPU ID uh, instruction with two different leaves. One, it's, it's used to detect the support for Intel processor trace. The second one is, um, is used to detect the feature of processor trace because different uh, CPU can uh, uh, implement different features. Processor trace has been, implement, has been implemented in the first time in, the first, in Broadwell architectures, but uh, it was limited. Now in Skylake there is the full support and you can uh, trace whatever you would like. The Xeon CPU uh, there, um, will be uh, released by Intel in uh, the second quarter of 2017. It's, they are quite done. Okay, here in this slide I would like to show the, the, the code for detecting processor trace. As you can see, it's quite easy, and um, there's nothing special, only a pair of CPU ID instructions. Okay, um, let's speaking about why is it is so interesting. It's because it's impl implemented entirely in hardware. One of the basic things that we can say about this is that it's not de detectable by software, I mean, in user mode software. 
And uh, one uh, uh, important thing to say is that you can uh, trace whatever you want, ever, even SMI, SMI SMM uh, handler, and um, even an hypervisor code or whatever. The only things that you can't uh, trace is like the um, SZX secure container, but it's, it's, it's a good thing because the SZX by design should uh, um, work uh, in an isolated environment. <coughs> Okay, um, even here, quite fast, uh, how it works. The process of the trace, trace is works in three, in three modes. It can uh, uh, trace using three different kinds of filtering. The first is why by current privilege le level. I mean, you can uh, differentiate between kernel mode software and user mode software. The second uh, filtering mode is by PML for page table. In that way, you can trace only a single process because you can instruct uh, the processor trace to trace only a specific PML physical address page table. In that way, you can trace only a single process. Otherwise, the last um, filtering mode is by instruction pointer. You can set a start point and an end point and, and, uh, say, and uh, ask the processor trace to trace only that uh, window of code. And this is very cool. Um, the output logging uh, is uh, done directly in memory, in physical memory. That's why we need a driver to uh, manage that. And the, the logging could be implemented in two things, in two ways. The first one is single range. There is a circular buffer, and the, um, the trace is, is written always in the same place in memory. The second uh, uh, type is the uh, table of physical address, also known as TOPA. OK, even here, like, uh, quite fast. To implement the single range, uh, you, have, you should allocate a continuous physical memory buffer. And then you should set two proper model specific register. One is uh, the RT high T uh, output base and the output mask. And then you have uh, to start the trace uh, um, setting the um, trace EN uh, flag in the um, control re the register. The buffer is automatically filled in a circular manner by the, the, the CPU. The table of physical address. The table of physical addresses is, um, is a, a better um, implementation of the output because you can uh, set uh, um, various physical, physical memory address and you can uh, create a, like a table in which uh, you instruct the CPU where to write exactly in memory. It's very, um, yeah, it's very smart because you can even set a PMI interrupt that is raised by the CPU if uh, um, a, certa, uh, a certain part of the buffer is, uh, is filled by the, the log. And then you can stop, you can resume, you can do whatever you want. Uh, okay, different kind of packets. To, um, to log the software execution, uh, processor trace uses a different kind of, of, of trace packet. There are a lot of uh, um, uh, timing packets that we are not in interesting to. The, the, the packets that we are interesting to are the branch packet, the taken not taken, the target AP and flow update packets. There are, uh, those packets are the most interesting because uh, you can, with those you can uh, uh, trace the execution and soft, of the software and follow the uh, uh, execution even maybe uh, checking the, source, the, the assembly code. Here is a big uh, diagram. I will uh, refer you to the uh, Intel manual if you would like to understand the nitty gritty details of each packets. The one that, we, uh, as I have say, said, the one that we are interested in are the um, uh, branch uh, uh, packets. Taken, not taken, target IP and flow update. Okay, let's speak about the um, Intel uh, PT driver implementation. Okay, we have decided to write this driver to be able to uh, perform the trace directly in, uh, from, from a Windows operating system. At this time of this, of this uh, presentation, the driver is, is quite stable and in, in its version 0.5. It supports all the filtering mode combination and output modes. Is the, um, some new feature of this uh, release is that it supports even multiprocessors and it supports even kernel mode code tracing. As I have uh, told, uh, you can use the um, processor trace to trace even kernel software without any problem. Um, in the developing of this uh, driver, we, have, uh, we had overcome a lot of uh, problems, like uh, one of the most uh, big uh, problems are uh, the mapping of the PMI and interrupt, because there was not no documentation at all for uh, how to do that. 
and even uh, the multiprocessor because you have to um, manage and you have to uh, enable the processor trace to in, once in each processor. Okay, let's speak uh, fastly about the PMI interrupt. The PMI interrupt is, has been uh, raised by the processor trace when the, our buffer is full. And um, to do that, we have programmed the table of physical addresses in inserting this uh, uh, PMI interrupt request at the end of the, of the, of the buffer. How we can uh, be able to manage that? When the PMI interrupt raise, we suspend the target process, dump the, physic the physical memory, and then uh, resume. We had some problem in implementing this because, the, as, you, as you probably know, the, all the interrupts inside the x86 uh, um, architecture um, run at a very high hierarchical. And this is a, a quite a problem because from that code you, you, can, you can't do quite anything. Um, even uh, the user mode buffer, very fast uh, even here. We have, we have uh, found a way to directly map the physical, uh, the physical memory in a user mode buffer. And uh, we do this uh, in a smart uh, uh, manner. I think it's not, uh, we respect the security bond boundaries and um, we map it only the log buffer and that's all in user mode. And not in kernel mode. It's important because if you use a very big buffer, you have uh, the problem that for uh, the, um, the virtual address space, that's now it's not a problem in, in 64-bit uh, systems, but could be. Okay, uh, here is uh, where the things get uh, interesting, because in version 0.5, we have been able to support the multiprocessor and multi-thread uh, multi application. Um, each uh, uh, CPU has, uh, we have implemented in, in that way in uh, which the, um, each CPU has its uh, buffer associated with it. And it's uh, uh, mapped in user mode. And we signaled a PM high interrupt where the buffer is, will be filled. But here there is a problem because if we fire the PMI interrupt um, in the same way, the user mode application is not fast and is not able to detect which CPU is um, as the buffer full in a real-time way, in a, in a fast enough way. Then we have switched the implementation and implementing the user mode callbacks. I mean, uh, our user application has uh, um, spawn uh, one thread for each, for each CPU, and uh, each thread registers a PMI, a PMI callback uh, function. In that way, when uh, a CPU uh, has the buffer that is full, uh, call the exactly uh, right uh, user mode callback. Uh, here we have tested that even in, multi in a real uh, big multiprocessor uh, um, environment, if we don't decode uh, in real time uh, the binary log to transform it in a human readable text, uh, the performance are really good. I mean, we can't see the, the some slowdowns or something uh, in, uh, in the traced uh, application. Uh, speaking in summary, we have overcome this problem, but uh, the only problem that uh, we had is manage in managing a multi-threaded application, because as you already know, uh, for a CPU point of view, a thread doesn't exist. I mean, the CPU is, uh, executes some codes. That's not, uh, um, the CPU doesn't know if it's a, it belongs to one thread or another one. Okay, uh, if you try to launch Calc, the standard calculator in Windows 10, you will find that uh, there is, it's not uh, a standard process. It's a new app container process that uh, spawns another process. This is an, um, an example of the increasing uh, um, complex of the, even uh, the standard uh, process that spawn another process or multi-threaded. And here it could be, it could be a, um, a problem for our tracing purposes because, uh, uh, because of that. Um, for, to overcome that, we can, use, uh, we can identify the, uh, the paging information packets of each process and uh, um, use the processor trace in only, uh, and instruct him it to uh, filtering by CR3. But uh, we have a big drawback because the size of the log is huge. I mean, in that way you can uh, you trace all the process of the, in the user, uh, that runs in user mode, all the loader code and whatever. And this is, um, is a problem. 
The second uh, way to overcome this is, could be to register a process thread uh, creation callback in kernel mode and then trace only one process at a time. This solution is simple and it works, but sometimes it's not ac acceptable because, for example, some malware or some complex component, like, for example, Microsoft Word, uh, require the interaction from, uh, the, from different processes. And this is a problem. But uh, we are uh, researching um, a new way to do this because uh, um, originally we would like to um, enable processor trace by each thread, by in, uh, using a thread construction. The thread is um, known only in, uh, in, in software. Only Windows kernel know how to manage the threads. And um, our original idea were, uh, was to intercept the, tre the thread context switcher code and um, save manually all the model specific register uh, used in processor trace to, um, to, an, uh, to an area and then restore back when the context switcher restore the, the original thread. Um, when I was doing this, I was uh, manually saving all the model specific register on, a, on a, an external buffer. But someone has pinpointed to me an existence of another very cool instruction that is, no, is not known by the research community, but is very useful. Do you remember the old push AD instruction in x86 architecture? Basically, what it does is that uh, it pushes all the general purpose register in, user, in a user mode stack directly, only using one instruction. Now, the, in, uh, in a 64-bit environment, it, uh, something like that doesn't exist anymore. But Intel has made this uh, new cool uh, instruction called XSAVE. The XSAVE is uh, a new opcode in uh, the MD64 uh, instruction set that uh, basically saves, saves all uh, the, um, some uh, extended register, some uh, uh, register that belongs to the Intel architect architect architecture on a specific area. I mean, I have found that the XSAVE instruction can save MMX, SSE, AVX, AVX uh, uh, registers. And uh, I, I, written, I have written here that uh, what uh, is AVX 512 because I didn't know the existence. The cool feature about the, the cool feature about the XX save is that it can save even the uh, register that belongs to Intel processor trace and the new Intel memory protection extension. And this is very cool because using only one instruction, we can save all the um, registers that belongs to the processor trace directly in a very very fast manner without any problem. If you open the Intel manual, you will find that to use, to, to use this instruction, it's a bit uh, complex because there is an XSAVE instruction that is, uh, it, uh, belongs only to user mode. And to set what to save, you have to set an extender control register in user mode using a new uh, instruction that is called the XSET BV. But to be able to save the mode specific register directly, uh, you have to use another instruction you have to use the XSAVE S, that uh, it, sh it, sh it means XSAVE supervisor. And it's um, good uh, to use it in, uh, in kernel mode. Our driver uh, supports completely the XSAVE. And it was very funny because when I have implemented this, uh, I have found that the new Windows 10 uh, context widget are already implement uh, the support of this XSAVE, but only for user mode. Our original intention was uh, to uh, find a way to intercept or divert the key swap context routine. That is the kernel mode routine that Windows uses to perform the context switcher from one thread to another thread. If we are able to, to intercept this, we can save all the mode specific register belongs to processor trace directly in, a, in an area and then restore later. In that way, we can implement the tracing by thread. That is um, a completely software uh, um, uh, in a comp it lives in a completely software point of view. But uh, we found uh, some problems. Because, as you probably know, you can't uh, uh, touch in any kernel mode in an official, in any kernel mode function in an official way using, uh, for example, a hook, uh, uh, I don't know, a, di um, a code diversion or whatever. Because uh, otherwise, patch guard will blue screen of that your system. And, um, 
we found that this way is not feasible in a public uh, system. I mean, we can use our debug system. In a debug environment, you can do that, and PatchGuard doesn't uh, run, and it's not a problem. But it's not a, a, a viable way in a production system. The second uh, solution that we found is uh, the, usage, the usage of ETW. If you check the documentation about ETW, there is a way to intercept the, the context switcher, but it's it's, um, we, are, we are still uh, doing some research because uh, the, um, the API are very complex and uh, we are trying to get if we are able to use in a legally way ETW to implement the, 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 thread, um, uh, the, pro, the, pro, the, the trace by trade. Okay, another cool feature of the, the new relays is that uh, um, we, the, um, the, the driver full, now fully support the um, kernel mode tracing. We have uh, implemented uh, 11 new kernel APIs that you can uh, uh, attach to your driver. And uh, you, you can use it manually to decide what to trace, to, do, to decide how to trace, and to do whatever from a kernel driver. But we were not happy with this, because we would like even to implement the, the tracing from a user mode application. Then we have, uh, we have created some high OCTLs that you can communicate with, uh, with, my dri with our driver. And um, it's able to do uh, kernel tracing directly in, uh, from uh, user mode. And uh, to do this, we have overcame a lot of uh, security uh, problems. But now uh, you can do that. Uh, from uh, our uh, user mode application, you can uh, even trace the um, kernel uh, uh, code. I, say, I uh, wrote here that uh, in this way we, we are able to, for example, trace the loading or unloading of a kernel module, or even if maybe you are studying some IOCTL in a rootkit or whatever, you can even trace only the IOCTL code, because as you know, the IOCTL in kernel uh, uh, environment are, are uh, processed asynchronous, asynchronously when uh, a user mode application uh, asks. Okay, uh, some uh, qu quick words about how to use the, the, the driver. The, as you can see, the, the code is quite simple. First of all, you have to uh, grab a handle of, the, of our device. It's quite easy, the, the device name is named Windows Intel PT Dev. After that, you have to fill an, um, a data structure named PT User Rec, that is in, in a request. And then you have to ask the um, I.O. Uh, manager to send uh, the uh, IOCTL to our device, uh, specify the user request. Um, after all, the, um, after this, this the, the trace starts. You can decide where to stop the trace using another IOCTL. This is very important because if you close the uh, application, in, uh, without doing that. It means that uh, your processor is still uh, uh, tracing uh, something. And uh, this could lead uh, a problem if you try to unload our driver, because the, the, the processor is not cleared. But the driver is able to detect this and to overcome this. But like, um, it's a good, pra good practice to do that. For multiprocessor code, you can uh, spawn a, a, a user mode thread directly without any problem. And then from the user mode uh, thread, you have uh, to uh, emit, um, to call the I.O. Uh, manager to um, send uh, the uh, register PMI routine IOCTL to our device. That's all. Then you wait. You wait in an infinite loop. In inf infinite, in infinite loop. And uh, the only, pro the only uh, things to take care is that uh, there is a, a parameter in the sleep hex uh, function that is named alertable or not. You have to insert true. In that way, every time the, um, the CPU buffer gets filled, the callback has, uh, will be called without any problem. OK, now it's time for a demo. I don't know how much. We have. Very, uh, we have to be very uh, fast. Okay, I have prepared a demo for you. Okay, you can see.
Okay, as you can see here, there is the code of a very simple application. It asks only some question to the user. Let's try to run it. Um, no kernel trace. Target process is, uh, um, uh, is our simple application. Andrea, you can see here. Ah, yeah, right. Okay, just a moment. How many CPU? Uh, at, the, at the beginning, let's do one, only one CPU. Uh, he's asking you to increase the font size. Ah, okay. And you can probably just mirror it since we switch. Yeah, it's, I think that it's better, but... So while he's setting this up, I'll, I'll recap a little bit about what uh, he just went over. So our new driver, when we presented it last year in June, all we had shown is the raw capture of the binary trace. And so those packets of taken, not taken, taken IP, and timing was all that we had available. So we had to figure out how to decode this, and he's going to show you a tracing in different modes and visualizing it in IDA. So. OK, can you see now? OK. Let's do in the beginning for one, only one processor. How many Recon conferences have you attended, guys? <laughs> Let's say three. Let's try with three. OK. The application has ended saying uh, uh, you are on a good track. That's it. Let's exit, exit and try to um, uh, open uh, the executable in, in, uh, using HIDA. Okay, here there is the code. Our goal is to trace this software. We have developed a, a, a um, IDA plugin that does this for us. Let's feed it with the text log. Wait a moment. Okay, an exception. <laughs> But, uh, as you can see, this is exactly the code that it has run. The exception was not voluntary, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so we use a library from Intel called libipt. It's open source. And it provides the decoding of the binary trace to a text uh, file that we're parsing in the plugin for right now. Later, okay. Later, we'll integrate the uh, decoding within the plugin. Okay. Now I will. I would like even to show you the same, but using multiprocessor environment. Let's see where is the part of my process. How many? Pro uh, how many processor? Four. And now let's say eight conferences. Okay. The results are different, and you can see in the in the summary. Each processor has its own uh, uh, buffer with different number of packets. OK, it's this dump. As you can see, there are different uh, um, binary files and text files for each processor. Now we'll increase the font size, just a moment. Can you see, guys? Yeah? As you can see, this is a, a CPU number one. It has all the uh, uh, packet, the taken, not taken, and the paging, page generation enable and disable, because the context switcher of Windows um, switch to different thread. This is one CPU, but for example, if you are lucky, we are not lucky. There is even some uh, um, logs that are quite clear, because it means that the Windows has executed this uh, um, executable only for a small period of time. This is not the case because luckily we, the context switcher that's run for, uh, uh, dif for each different CPU, but sometimes it happens that even the log for uh, one uh, um, processor is empty. And this is our implementation. Can you if pull up one of those text files again? Okay. I just wanted to point out, so when you read these text files, you can see that 
For indirect branches and return addresses, we actually get the full 64-bit target address. Um, but if you look at like the TNT packets, those are uh, indicating whether or not a conditional branch was taken. So they only store a single bit that determines whether or not you took the true or false branch. So you have to recover that later on and disassemble in real time to recover what the target addresses were for those conditional branches. We have time. Yeah. I would like to show even an experimental demo that uh, uh, uses kernel tracing directly for user mode. For this demo, I have uh, chosen an ACP driver, not for uh, a specific reason, because it was randomly chosen. And it's, I have found that the system calls this interface uh, a lot of times. Let's try to do even this, uh, to, uh, to take even those dump. <laughs> the Explorer has been blocked, amazing. <laughs> okay. Let's say yes, acpi.sys. Let's say go. Number of process of CPU, like just one for this time. OK, it asks, I'm tracing. Do something and then stop me. I do, for example, some movement on, the, on my PC. And then at a point of, point of time, I will say stop. In this time, we were quite lucky because uh, as you can see, the processor number one has taken some packets. Let's see what uh, are those packets. OK, as you can see, um, there is not so a, lo a lot of time, a lot of things registered here, but something is, has been taken. Let's try to use our plugin to be able to trace what. You can see this is the code of ACPI. Unfortunately, I have no symbol about this because it's a, um, a, an in-flight uh, release of, a new, of uh, Windows 10. But let's try. OK, the plugin has worked. You can, see, you can see now because the driver entry has ne never been called. It has been already called in the, in, in when you have switched on your system. But if you see the log, there is a lot of time called this, this special function. That could be an AOCTL or whatever. Let's try to go. Yes, this is an AOCTL. You can see? Just a moment. I will. This, is a, this should be blindly, without uh, knowing anything about the interface of the driver. We can probably say that this is an AOCTL because the code is executed a lot of times because for the color, the color is darker, and uh, it means that the CPU has executed this uh, function a lot of times. As you can see, there are um, traced all the branches. This is, ah, oh, come on, it's, it's not taken. And you can see there is the branch, and all the branches are uh, traced. And that is uh, the demo about the um, kernel tracing from user mode. From kernel mode, if you develop your driver, you are e even be, a be able to trace the driver entry or uh, uh, driver unload routine. I can show that right now because first, we don't have time. And second, I, my computer is switched on in a release environment. Because for doing that, of course, uh, we, we can't use a signed driver. But it's feasible. If you do that, in a, if you write your kernel driver and you sign your kernel driver, you can, you can, you can do whatever you would like. OK, let's return back to the. So, that's so now we'll switch. Ah, OK, yes. Yeah. So yeah, so to recap, uh, the driver now supports kernel tracing and user mode tracing. You can filter based upon the CR3, so a single whole process. You can trace the entire kernel space, or you can isolate uh, ranges of contiguous IP, um, that, and you get up to four different ranges. So um, now I'm going to demonstrate this in a practical real-world scenario inside of uh, AFL. 
So we have this fast tracing engine, um, and you'll see some performance numbers that are real world here. But in the manuals, they are targeting a five to fifteen percent trace overhead for the entire system. So uh, per core, you should be able to trace both kernel mode operations and user mode operations for only a five to fifteen percent. And I'll actually be able to show you that um, and how that works. You oh, don't have I'm this sorry. Video. Yes. Yes. Oh, I'm sorry. That will help. It's that one. Yes. OK. So how do we use this and apply it for vulnerability discovery? So um, who here is familiar with American Fuzzy Lop, has used it? Uh, we have people who do fuzzing in the crowd. OK, a good portion here. So in the last few years, we've seen um, well an evolutionary jump in fuzzing technology. Basically, we've gone from using dumb fuzzing or um, grammar-based fuzzing that wasn't able to determine whether or not the samples that were being generated were useful to applying a new technology or um, engineering an older technology into something that's performant enough to be used. And, and we call that evolutionary fuzzing. So we take the idea of dumb fuzzing mutation and we combine it with uh, the ability to collect a feedback signal using code coverage. And then we assess the fitness of that new randomly generated input against the entire lifetime of your fuzzing cycle. And so basically what we can do is we can look at this code coverage information, determine if this newly generated input actually gets us to a different part of the code. And if it does, then we'll introduce that into our entire pool of samples and continue to mutate and fuzz those as we go. So over time, we're refining our set of inputs and getting, we're building a corpus. And each one of those inputs exercises a slightly different part of the code. And in effect, what we've seen is the last uh, three or four years since this has been available, um, this has highly optimized your compute time when it comes to doing dumb fuzzing. Um, and so the, uh, the last couple talks I've given have focused on this technology. And so I encourage you to go look at previous slide decks, which are on the Recon website or my website at moflow.org. Um, but basically, through researching this, I've resolved that the main things that we need to effectively deploy this technology is we need a fast tracing engine. And of course, that was the inspiration to look into Intel Processor Trace, because the promise of 15% overhead against closed source binary software is pretty incredible compared to the technologies that we've had available before. Previously, hardware tracing is not new to Intel. Um, since the P4, there's been the ability to do hardware tracing. Um, there's mechanisms called Branch Trace Store, uh, BTS, which is, works in a similar fashion, but was not designed in a way that was optimized. It didn't write to physical RAM. It, did, it uh, polluted your cache and things like that. So we saw a massive slowdown. And then you have another option, which is called uh, Last Branch Record, which is only 32 registers uh, in modern processors. And those only give you the last 32 branches. So you'd have to interrupt every time, every 32 branches to uh, parse that and use that. And, um, or you'd have to write a driver that flushes that out to a different cache and, and do other things. So while this isn't new, this is designed for the first time to be highly performant. Up until Intel Processor Trace, it was actually faster to use software-based tracers, um, things that would do dynamic binary instrumentation using Dynamo Rio or PIN or um, something like that. So um, now we have this fast tracing engine. That's great. Uh, we need fast logging, which is something that we get out of the design of AFL. AFL uses a bloom filter that allows you to quickly look up whether or not you've um, done the same code coverage. So instead of parsing a, a text file or binary file that's just a list of addresses of basic blocks consecutively, um, we actually parse that in real time and fill a bloom filter. So you can just check to see if this 64K of RAM is identical to another 64K of RAM instead of doing a comparison of each address. And then um, through some of my other research, there's been other attempts at evolutionary fuzzing starting about 2004 or 2005, uh, Jared DeMott did some of his PhD research on this. And uh, he had something called the evolutionary fuzzing system. Um, but it was based upon basically um, 
the BTS record or uh, debugger breakpoints, so it was quite slow in its tracing, and then it was also over-engineered trying to um, incorporate too much of the research that's in the evolutionary like biology side of things. So, so the key is to have this fast tracing engine, uh, efficient logging, and to keep the, the analysis to the minimum. So in 2013, uh, Michael Zaleski, who's contributed a lot of great stuff to our industry, um, produced the first performant open source evolutionary fuzzer called American Fuzzy Lop. Um, it uses a pretty comprehensive list of uh, types of fuzzing strategies, whether it's bit flipping, byte flipping, D word flipping, and so on, um, crossovers, and various types of mutation. Um, it uses, originally it used block coverage via a plugin, or a post process of the GCC compilation. It would compile your code to assembler and then annotate the assembler to add callback hooks at every basic block entry point. And then that's through that modified source code, that's how you got your um, code coverage. And then, as I mentioned, he takes those edge transitions, basically shifts and zores them together, and then uh, increments offsets into this bloom filter or, or byte map um, that is basically able to track you know, whether or not you've seen this edge before. Now, you can't get out what those addresses were originally because it's simply an offset into this um, mapping, but you can very quickly look up, have I been here before? And that's all we care about as far as whether or not to keep that sample. Um, and then, of course, it was written on top of the POSIX API, so it wasn't Windows compatible out the gate. Um, the benefits that it has, it tracks edge transitions and not just block entry. Um, it uses the Bloom filter. It had a fork server built into it. So basically, after your process has initialized, it waited until all your libraries are loaded and all the linking and everything is done. And then once you get to the parser code, then it would fork. And so you skip all that initialization time, which is an optimization. Um, and then, very importantly, he introduced persistent mode fuzzing, which is an in-memory uh, type of fuzzing where you're not exiting and recreating the process every time. You're giving it a, a pointer to a function and the number of arguments to that function and saying, okay, once you exit this section of code, start over again and take our new inputs as inputs to this function. And so that also reduces the amount of code that you're tracing and executing um, down to the minimal points as an optimization. And then, uh, importantly, you can use this to build a corpus uh, on open source software. It's very fast. And so you can use those as inputs into your pipeline on maybe slower or more heavyweight analysis uh, on other types of fuzzing. So the way they do their tracing is every block gets a unique ID. The edges are indexed in that map. Uh, it creates that hash using the shift and zor. And then we increment the map. So, um, this was great. I was looking into this and how to optimize this and bring this to the Windows platform. Um, obviously, we can't use well, we can't use source code instrumentation for the majority of the tar software that we're targeting. So we needed something that could do uh, binary targeting, um, and so this seemed ideal versus the other options of using PIN or Dynamo Rio and so on. And so last summer, uh, you know, we decided to start looking into this. Well, uh, around that same time of my talk at Intel or at uh, Recon last year. Uh, Ivan Fratrick from Google, uh, I think he's Project Zero or Google Security, released uh, WinAFL, which was a port of Michael Zaleski's AFL to Windows using Dynamo Rio as a backend. Uh, are you guys familiar with PIN or Dynamo Rio? They're basically loaders for your program, and as you visit each new basic block of code, it caches that and allows you to modify it in real time. So um, it's a kind of heavy, uh, Valgrind works the same way if you're familiar with that. So it was using that as a back end. Um, it's really cool. It works. It was like the first thing that you could just go download right now and start fuzzing Windows GDI in five minutes. Beautiful. Um, the biggest thing that's allowed it to be uh, a performance is that it uses this persistent mode where it doesn't exit the process. So these loaders like PIN or Dynamo Rio, they have to disassemble your program to instrument them. Um, so he was able to, and, and I did some experimentation on trying to do forking in Windows uh, previous talks, and it turns out it's just a real pain. So um, using persistent mode, you get things like you don't have to worry about ASLR because you're not exiting the process. And you don't have to re you don't have to re disassemble the process every time because you're using that code cache. So, WinAFL turned out to be pretty well engineered. 
Um, and basically, you can tell it how many iterations to persist, like, you know, maybe do a thousand iterations, and then go ahead and exit and restart the process so that we can, if we have any memory leaks or we're not quite cleaning up properly, uh, we can just handle that through delaying the restart. Uh, now, persistence is key because every time you load this in the DBI, it's going to disassemble it. So if we were to just do it every time, we'd get two executions a second on this GDI plus demo I'm going to show you. Um, if we persisted 100 times before we restart it, 72 executions a second and so on, it reaches its ceiling somewhere around uh, 1,000 or so iterations. So uh, we've now integrated our Intel PT driver into WinAFL as an alternative uh, tracer engine. And um, now this brings some problems, because the reason I had him show you the text version of that dump was that we don't have all of the addresses in the log file. So we have to recover some of those along the way. Um, the, we don't have persistence mode working quite yet, unfortunately. I've done some experimentation here. It's around the corner. Um, but the next time we present at Hack in the Box, this will be available. I'm building my tooling on top of Alex Ionescu's great work from last year at Recon on uh, the application verifier hooking system. Um, and so basically, as it is, um, using the IP filtering mode, so you can specify up to four DLLs that you want to trace, or you know, four modules or any address ranges in your process that you want to trace, and so on. Um, the current status now is that we do accurately decode the full trace, so doing disassembly online and using a cache for the control flow graph that you recover. So I first look to see if we've already resolved what this upcoming conditional branch is. And if so, then it's a quick index. If not, I have to disassemble forward to determine the targets for the conditional branch and then store those in a structure. Um, the edge and source destination are recorded as expected, so we're not reduced to basic blocks. We actually do get the edges. And um, I'm currently just using create process, so we're doing this iter iteratively rather than uh, forking or persistence mode yet. So, um, in order to determine the performance of this tracing mechanism, I first made a dummy looping benchmark. So basically, it was just creating the process and waiting for it to exit. Um, and so we get our kind of maximum bounds on how many iterations we'll be able to execute with this sample. Um, in this case, I found that we could get 85 executions a second without doing any tracing. Um, we're just generating the fuzz or input and running it without um, anything like that. We're not parsing the log file. We're not doing anything. So once we enable the tracing, uh, that was reduced to 72 executions a second, which is right in that sweet zone of 15% overhead that Intel was promising for this particular sample. So uh, parsing the log file was an additional 22% overhead. So now we're down to 55 executions a second. And um, I'll demo what this all means for you here. So we'll compare it to the... I'm going to show you. So we're going to fuzz GDI plus. This is an experiment that comes with the WinAFL out the gate. Um, you just pass it some image files, and it uses Windows to render them um, without rendering to the screen. And this is a live demo of that working. So currently, this is using Dynamo Rio and persistence mode with the maximum number of iterations possible. And we see that it's getting 127 executions a second. The lighting is not good here. Um, unfortunately, but hopefully you guys can see that a little bit. I, I can increase the font just quickly here. So, yeah, so what we're looking at here is this number specifically. So we get 126 executions a second using Dynamo Rio versus GDI. So let's see how our uh, Windows PT driver performs in comparison. Oh, sorry, that's me decoding the log here. So let's redirect that out to null. Okay, so we're seeing with that overhead of the 15% for tracing and then the additional overhead of 22% for decoding, um, this will creep up a little bit, but we're only getting about 40-something 40, 40 executions a second. That's a little bit disappointing. We're kind of we're hoping to see a little bit faster. Now, you have to keep in mind, again, that this is just iterative tracing. We're not doing in-memory fuzzing. So once we get to doing in-memory fuzzing, this number will su increase significantly. However, this is not the end of the story. I originally was doing all my testing against their setup with the GDI Plus wrapper. 
Um, and as you can see in my command line here, this is tracing only the Windows Codex DLL and the GDI Plus DLL in the process. So I made a, another um, demo in order to compare the performance. And this time we'll trace libpng uh, using WinAFL. And so this is just uh, libpng statically compiled into a small harness that will um, just load a PNG file, it'll fuzz it, and then it will do, fix up checksums, and then it will parse it through libpng. And we see that the performance becomes quite abysmal, actually. So this is the Dynamo Rio. Um, that's expected. Uh, but we're seeing only uh, half an ex 0.5 executions per second. So this is quite slow, obviously. This is not where we want to be. Um, and this is because since this is statically compiled, all of the code involved in libpng, including the uh, encryption uh, or compression and things like that are included here, which causes some issues uh, in the Dynamo Rio backend. Now here's the fun part. We have a constant overhead when we use Intel PT. So using Intel PT, we can see that we're back up in that, this will creep up to about 55, 60 executions a second. So instead of being only half an execution a second, this is 100 times faster than the Dynamo Rio backend. And this is doing the full co code coverage tracing, finding new paths, and so on. So, um, so with this engine, we've done 100 times performance increase um, depending on your target application. And this is not specifically chosen. This was just randomly. I had this fuzzer laying around and used it as a demo. So, um, so yeah, so that's my demos for this plugged into WinAFL. Thank you. And so just some um, closing remarks now. Um, number one, all the code that we've written is already open source or going to be open source. Uh, we're on GitHub slash Intel PT, real simple. The driver is already there. Um, I actually have a pull request from Andrea from last night. So the, the latest version is on GitHub. It'll be merged tonight. Um, the WinAFL needs a little cleanup. I was up till 3.30 last night making my final preparations. So uh, that code will be up next week. Um, and then we just have a, a few more things that we need to address. But obviously, you know, we see that code coverage is being finally harnessed to make our fuzzing uh, better. We can load this information into IDA to uh, do our analysis of a crash or of malware or whatever it might be. And using the hardware supported tracing engine, we don't have any issues like you would have with other software based instrumentation and hooking engines. You know, once, uh, you know, one of our future plans is to get this into a hypervisor so that we can trace the guests inside of a hypervisor. And then your, um, you know, your malware tracing will be basically, you know, unobservable and you won't be able to disable it um, in that method. There are um, capabilities of deploying Intel PT to trace things like SGX mode and SMM and BMM, and those are kind of future areas of work. Um, and then also my end goal is, of course, to get this fully supported with persistent mode and everything as well. Um, one thing that we need to do as part of that is to uh, finish the ETW-based uh, thread context switch awareness because uh, we need to separate these logs out into a per-thread instance. Um, otherwise, you have to use the timing information and to determine where the synchronization is between the threads, and that slows down the parsing a lot. So our goal is to get the logs individualized before you do your parsing, and so you only have to parse the thread that you care about that's doing your, you know, your file or network I.O. Um, and did you have any further comments on the solutions? Mm, just uh, wanted to say that the new version that we are going to release uh, already support the XSAVE uh, feature, and uh, if you download it, you can test it uh, directly, and uh, it's quite a cool uh, feature, at least in my, my opinion. Okay, so you can get this code, and you can reach us on Twitter, and thank you very much. Hopefully, I think we might have a minute for questions. We're just on time. Uh, yes. Hey, uh, thanks. Uh, can you trace inside the virtual machine? Uh, so currently, there are we. 
There aren't any hypervisors that currently expose this and virtualize this. So, for example, in the other hardware tracing modes, the hypervisor has to virtualize the support for writing to those MSRs. This does exist, like, for example, in VMware using the BTS mechanism, but Intel PT is rather new, so there aren't any hypervisors that are available yet. So we are either going to have to modify Zen or KVM, um, and we've been actually even just today talking about perhaps being able to trace the entirety of the hypervisor and then later on pull out only the user mode processor kernel threads that you're interested in. So currently, no, um, but absolutely we'll continue working on this until we get there. Thanks. Uh, yeah, and I know that that will hopefully be applicable for Cuckoo Sandbox, so. <laughs> uh, were there any other questions? No? Okay, feel free to grab us. Thank you very much for your attention.